This is RTV6 News at 5.30, working for you. And now at 5.30, we all want to learn more about our health. And now when you give blood, you may learn more than you would have expected just a few months ago. And making ends meet, it can be difficult at any time, but especially now, the free financial planning help that is available to you. Chris. All right, here's what we're talking about today in our lineup. A woman who was one of the first in the country to get COVID-19 is now dealing with another kind of struggle, the guilt and harassment that she is facing because of her diagnosis. Plus, an influential pastor is calling out the church, saying it played a role in the racism that we see today. What he says needs to change. And the CDC recommends masks, but let's face it, some people wear them, others don't. We're taking a look at the etiquette surrounding asking someone to put one on. And first at 5.30, starting this week, the Red Cross will be providing COVID-19 antibody testing on all blood, platelet, and plasma donations. As RTV6's Alyssa Donovan explains, it's a way for you to learn more about your health and learn more about the spread of coronavirus. Whenever you donate blood, plasma, or platelets to the Red Cross, your donation is tested for certain infectious diseases and viruses. And now COVID-19 is part of that list. There's already a list of things um, that we test for whenever you donate blood. This will be as part of that process. The antibody testing is a way for the Red Cross to work with state and national health organizations to help better understand the spread of COVID-19 and for people within our community to learn more about their current health. That will help them know if they have uh, been exposed to the virus. And right now there is a blood shortage. The Red Cross needs donors. The blood supply has been on a bit of a roller coaster since the beginning of the pandemic. Cancellations of blood drives caused blood supply to drop quickly. Initially, the lack of elective surgeries helped keep things balanced. Uh, but now the hospitals are adding back in elective surgeries and non-urgent care. The need for blood is going up very quickly. In the last few weeks, the Red Cross has seen an increase of blood demand of about 30%, which is why they're encouraging people to donate, but only if if they're feeling well enough to do so. If you suspect you might have COVID-19, you know, that's something you should go to your doctor for, not, not the Red Cross. Within seven to 10 days, you'll have access to your antibody results via the donor app or online through your donor account. For details on where you can donate blood around the Indianapolis area, we have a full list on our website, theindychannel.com. I'm Melissa Donovan, RTV6. Thank you, Alyssa. It's been another nice June day. Our dry stretch continues on here. We start off with some sunshine. You can see there are some fair weather cumulus and cirrus clouds out there this evening for us. And temperatures that warmed up pretty nicely this afternoon. Got a little toasty out there, especially in that sunshine. Our temperature right now, it sits at that 83 degree mark. That's after a high of 85. But also part of the story, the humidity just 37 percent, courtesy of that east breeze around 10 miles per hour. Temperature wise, warm spot, Bedford here at 87. It's 85 in Muncie and Richmond at 81. High pressure in control of our weather pattern, but there's this pesky area of low pressure that's sitting off the east coast will actually come back our way and could bring a slight chance for some showers tomorrow. We could certainly use some rainfall though. You can see over the month we've only picked up about an inch of rainfall, so we do have a deficit there. Still a little bit of a surplus though for the year. Going to be grilling out this evening, though. You got some great weather for that. You're not going to have to worry about any rainfall out there with those temperatures. And partly sunny skies will be in the upper 70s still through 9 o'clock. Chris? Senate Republicans unveiling their police reform bill today. The proposal does not ban chokeholds like Democrats wanted, but it would withhold federal funding from police departments that don't stop using the technique. It also focuses on data collection for no-knock warrants. Democrats want these banned in drug cases. The Republican bill would not eliminate qualified immunity, which protects officers from being sued. Democrats want that included. The bill from Senate Republicans would also provide federal dollars for additional training on alternatives to use of force. Another aspect states could consider is the amount of time that it takes to become an officer. The number of hours required really varies nationally. In some places, it's actually less than what's required to become a barber. Now, Kirk Burkhalter is a former New York City police detective, and he suggests the standard six months of training move to a two-year curriculum. Gives us an opportunity of two years to really have uh, someone have a strong eye on these candidates to understand if they are taking 
these educational requirements on if they're internalizing them. Forest Science Institute, which provides training and consulting to law enforcement, looked into how the training officers are receiving holds up. It found in its two-year study of three large U.S. police academies that skills like using a baton or taking down an aggressive offender deteriorate dramatically within two weeks. The group says skills aren't being taught well enough to be retained. Burkhalter agrees with that and says officer decision-making training also needs to change. The decision of why are you in this situation in the first place, the decision of what the, the concept that covering concealment, right? So is this person going to be a danger to society? Let me back off. What's going to happen if I let this person get away right at this point? What is the risk versus the reward of that? He says training really needs to go beyond just whether they're to shoot or not to shoot, instead focusing on thoughtfulness and situational assessment. A training academy that we visited in Washington State around four years ago is one place that has gotten attention for changes that it made to how officers are trained. Police there learn how to de-escalate tense situations without weapons, but still receive physical training as well. All right, ahead in our lineup, there has been a lot of news this week of possible coronavirus treatments. We are getting perspective on what is showing the most promise. 20% on auto and home. Welcome back. Managing money these days might be tougher than ever with so many Hoosiers dealing with layoffs or sudden medical bills. The Rebound Indiana is bringing you advice from experts that can help you and your family make it through this economic crisis. RTV6's Mark Mullen sat down with a member of the Financial Planning Association to learn about a free program to help families manage their money. The, the old adage of you don't know what you don't know is, is very true here. This is to try to reach out and to assist those who may have been affected or maybe some of the frontline workers who are focused on you know their job or focusing on getting their health better. We also wanted to know how families can help themselves during this tough economic time. I've also found just helping people kind of uh, peel back the layers on their budget and kind of looking at what's going on there to figure out what are the things they really need to focus on versus things that, you know, in this time right now are maybe a bit of a luxury. All you have to do is head to the Financial Planning Association's website, which includes fiduciaries across the nation, and search for COVID-19 pro bono planning. And then search for Indiana. Simple as that. So what's the catch? The most important thing for people to understand too that you know this is truly a pro bono. There, there is no catch. This is just to help people out. These are certified financial planners, so those who have gone through you know an extra layer of certification and years of experience, so that you know that the advice that you're getting is someone who, who's a trusted industry veteran. Um, and yeah, there's there's no strings attached. And we've featured interviews with Ed all week on RTV6. If you have missed any of those talks, you can see all of these segments on our website at theindychannel.com slash rebound. We've also provided a link to the FPA program under this story. We're getting perspective today on new promising treatments for COVID-19. The newest one being discussed is a highly potent steroid that's actually been around for a while and is well understood. Dexamethasone was found to help people on ventilators or oxygen walk out of the hospital on their own. Death rates were lower than those who didn't get the steroid. And I suspect that once the data is studied, it will become best practice for older patients in the hospital on ventilators and getting oxygen. That's a huge public health victory. Peter Pitts, formerly with the FDA and president of the Center for Medicine and Public Interest, says the difference with the drug is more data. Some 6,000 patients were studied by Oxford. Now, with the drug hydroxychloroquine, the first research study was small. The FDA has since removed its emergency use authorization, mainly because the risk outweighs the benefits. Meanwhile, there are a number of other studies coming out of the National Institutes of Health on BTK inhibitors, drugs generally for cancer patients. One recently published study showed promise in helping reduce inflammation and improve breathing in COVID patients. Pitts also believes there will be multiple vaccines next year. You think of for children, one for the general population, and then older people. I think we're going to have to educate the public as to who gets vaccinated first, second, third, uh, police officers, firefighters, teachers, students. We have to convince people that vaccines are safe and effective. And quite frankly, I'm a pretty pragmatic guy. 
But people who say they don't want to get vaccinated, in my mind, are healthcare terrorists. The only way we're going to close down COVID-19 and get back to a new normal is to pull together and do the right thing and follow the science. Health insurance companies are expected to fully cover COVID-19 vaccines whenever they are available. All right, ahead in our lineup once again, a widely respected black spiritual leader is weighing in on the movement to end racism. Because our nation is so divided, it's really opened up an opportunity for unity. Pastor Tony Evans talking to us about his experience with racism, the church's role, and how it can be part of the solution. See, even PD can do it. More than 2 million Americans have gotten sick with COVID-19, but for the thousands who have recovered, they're facing a new kind of stigma and loneliness. Chris Conti introducing us to a woman who wants other coronavirus victims to know that they are not alone. It is hard to imagine that surrounded by landscapes like this, any resident of Cohasset, Massachusetts would be struggling as much as Kelsey Hindley right now. I think it's a lot about the fear of the unknown. As a high school French teacher, Kelsey spent the beginning of the year looking forward to a trip abroad to Europe with her students in February. It was before the U.S. went into lockdown. She felt a little sick before leaving, but it kept getting worse. I just remember like this pain that I've never felt before. It was muscular and it was all the way to the bones. By the time Kelsey flew back to the U.S., news of the coronavirus was everywhere. Eventually, she was diagnosed with the virus, only the second person in her entire state. People she'd never met in town were suddenly taking to social media, concerned Kelsey had somehow spread the virus even though she was in quarantine. Some said she should leave town. My anxiety level has never been that high in my entire life. I felt so bad. I felt like I had done something to people. Months later, it's that kind of survivor's guilt that Kelsey wants other people to understand. A sense of isolation that she and thousands of other Americans who have had COVID are now experiencing. Unless you've been sick, you don't understand how it feels. It just feels extremely isolating, I'll tell you that. Hesitant to tell her story at first, this 28-year-old wants other COVID victims to know they aren't alone. But I want people to look at people like me and the others who have recovered and see that we do get better. And not just that we do get better, like we do move on with our lives. And that's really important as well. Don't hold this against people just because we got sick. As for life now, Kelsey is back to teaching. And like the rest of us, cautiously moving forward into an uncertain future. As more and more people get better, I hope that the general public doesn't see this as a death threat. In Cohasset, Massachusetts, I'm Chris Conti reporting. Chris, thank you. And many frontline healthcare workers are still in the thick of COVID-19. We have never had to separate ourselves from the loved ones of the patient that's in the hospital. And as a pediatrician, it just goes against everything we know how to do. Dr. Sarah Norris works with child cancer patients in the Bronx. When COVID-19 hit, her children's hospital took on adult virus patients. She quickly had to train staff on how to have quick but compassionate conversations with patients and family members over the phone. Dr. Norris says it has made her more aware of time. We get 24 hours in a day, but what do we do with it? How do we actually make sure that what we're spending our time on is serving others and serving our own values? Dr. Norris says that she also focuses on being more present in the moment. She asks everyone to wear masks and practice social distancing. I can only imagine for those who have died that they want us to continue to make just even tiny sacrifices so that those they have left behind get a chance to live. Dr. Norris was one of several hospital heroes recognized by U.S. News during the pandemic. Lots of smiles, waves, and celebrating today to mark a milestone in the lives of many children. Today was graduation day for students at St. Joseph Institute for the Deaf on the city's northwest side. Each year, the program celebrates students who graduate and are ready to return to their local community schools. But due to COVID-19, that was not possible this year. So today, teachers and staff held a graduation parade for the kids instead. Today's fun celebrated the only graduates, but all the kids for making it through the school year. The Institute teaches young deaf children how to listen and speak through cochlear implants or hearing aids. Congratulations, Kyle. 
Yeah, Amanda, you know, it's been about two weeks since we've had any measurable rain here in central Indiana, and that's going to really allow those temperatures to build on themselves and warm up pretty quickly. This afternoon, we made it into the mid-80s, sitting at 83 degrees with those partly sunny to mostly cloudy skies right now in the Circle City. It's 85 in Bloomington, and the humidity, the muggy meter, that's been very comfortable on the low end of the scale. Tomorrow, it's going to inch up just a little bit, but still in that comfortable range, so not feeling too bad here for the middle of June. Tonight, 64, we'll have those clouds around, but again, we're going to keep things dry as we go through the day. Here's a look at TrueCast, that area of low pressure off to our southeast. It starts to swing some of that cloud cover back our direction, and as we get into the afternoon, can't rule out around Richmond and Connorsville that we do have an isolated shower, but I think most areas are going to be staying dry with the bulk of the rain over into Ohio as we go throughout our Thursday. So temperatures, they warm quickly. We'll go from the upper 60s at 8 a.m. to 87 for that afternoon high. Again, not going to have much in the way of a heat index to deal with. A high of 87 for you in Tanville and Muncie at 86 degrees. The dogs are excited here about the warming trend that we got coming our way for those walks. We got highs that will get into the 90s Friday and Saturday. Would be our first time as we go into the 2020 year, but it has certainly felt that warm over the last couple of weeks here. As we look at the seven-day planning forecast, things are going to change. We're going to go from dry weather to a very active stretch of showers and thunderstorms and hopefully build back. Unfortunately, it looks like some of those rain chances coming with Father's Day. Chris? Perspectives on social justice across the country. Today we are talking with one of the most respected pastors in the country about what he says needs to change. You know, as a boy growing up in Baltimore, Maryland, I had to uh, deal with my father explaining to me why we couldn't go into certain restaurants due to segregation. As a 70-year-old black man, Tony Evans says he's experienced his fair share of racism and discrimination. I've gotten pulled over by police because I was in the wrong neighborhood. Why are you, why are you driving in this neighborhood? In college, uh, I went to a white church, and the white church told me that uh, I was not, I was not welcome there. Segregation nearly kept Evans from becoming the first African American to earn a doctorate of theology from Dallas Theological Seminary. If I would have applied a few years earlier, they would not have let me in because that was part of a whole history of segregation that was even in the, the theological religious realm. Early in his preaching, Evan says radio stations told him a black speaker might offend too many white listeners. Circumstance after circumstance like that, where I have uh, in my sphere, both secular and, and sacred, uh, have seen unrighteous decisions made on the basis of race. And uh, it contradicted the theology I was learning. Evan says the church was also a major contributor to racism today. If it, if it had never endorsed the unrighteous system of slavery in America, if it never gave theological validation for it, if it never uh, supported the social construct of it, then we wouldn't have it because it would have uh, trained its people to infiltrate the culture with a righteous and just worldview. Evans, who wrote a book on race called Oneness Embraced, says churches need to lead in the solution through service. Black Christians and white Christians crossing racial lines to serve other people in need. We could turn this thing around in a very short period of time because they would see us leading the way, not merely reacting to what people are doing at either extreme in the culture. Evans laid out a more detailed national three-point plan for how churches can respond to racism. But this is where God must be brought into play. And I must say, if he is left out, there will be no solution because he's the one that's ticked off about it. Now, some big news today from Quaker Oats that it's rebranding its popular syrup. We're talking about Aunt Jemima. It will be getting a new name and image. Quaker Oats says that it recognizes that Aunt Jemima's origins are based on a racial stereotype. The owner of Uncle Ben's Rice saying today that it will also be changing the brand's identity. Netflix is committing $120 million to the United Negro College Fund. It will also be donating to two historically black colleges. All right, next to our lineup, what to do if you come in close contact with a person not wearing a mask. The etiquette surrounding how to ask them to put one on.